Since 1785, The Times has been essential reading. Now, it's essential listening. Times Radio chooses conversation over confrontation. Covers Westminster and beyond. Ask the right questions. To keep you well informed. We give word space and let the stories do the talking. Listen on DAB Radio, online, on your smart speaker or via our app. Welcome to this co-production of the Times and the Sunday Times Cheltenham Literature Festival and Ake Arts and Book Festival Nigeria, part of five-episode series celebrating the careers of major world writers as part of Cheltenham's Read the World Festival theme. I am Molara Wood and I am delighted to be at home in Abeokuta with Nobel laureate Wale Shoinka, who's new novel is titled Chronicles from the Land of the Happiest People on Earth. Welcome. Thank you. This novel has two titles. I've noticed a longer one in the UK and elsewhere and a shorter one in Nigeria. It would seem that the shorter one, the, short, the shorthand is um, people in Nigeria can easily connect with it because uh, not so long ago, a survey declared uh, citizens of Nigeria as living in the happiest country on earth? Well, yes, it's, um, well, you know, we, we love names here anyway, titles, and uh, I don't see why the, um, the novel shouldn't benefit from a multiplicity of titles. But in all seriousness, it, it, it happened purely um, by, by chance. Uh, mostly my fault, I think. Uh, when you're playing around with titles, and by the time the proofs come back, Somehow, the land got lost. And the publishers, of course, assumed that that's what I wanted. Uh, and of course, the printer wouldn't have noticed it. I, when doing final corrections, I had noticed that it had slipped out. And so the paperback, actually, the Nigerian edition of paperback, which is coming out in about a month, will bear the correct title, the full title, Chronicles from the Land of the Happiest People, people on, on Earth. Earth. And I had to put the land back in, it is important, because one of the uh, themes which uh, re-echoes in the novel itself is the land. So I didn't want that m missed out in the title. Yes, you know, yes. brand of the land, etc., etc., in the novel. That is true, that is true, brand of the land. Well, uh, this is a country where some years ago a state governor appointed a commissioner for happiness. But you're sending all of this up, really, in this novel. You're lampooning this whole idea of happiness. Well, you know, when I read that, um, first of all, it happened on two levels. We had been designated by one of these international Gallup polls or whatever they call themselves. Uh, we, we ranked among the happiest, I can't, I've lost now, maybe the happiest 10. Certainly, no, not lower than that. But I think it was actually five. I think at first it was the happiest. Mm -hmm. And then a couple of years later, we were the we second were happiest. We were degraded. And it's been downhill ever since. Yeah. And uh, when that happened, I asked myself, who, who are these people? Have they been to Nigeria? Uh, do they know what the actuality is? But then to add insult to injury, one of the states here decided to set up a ministry of happiness. I thought it was one of the most ludicrous and actually provocative uh, notions ever entertained uh, by any arm of governors in the country. But of course, this is fodder material for the writer anywhere, painter, artist, even musician. I think there should be an opera on the happiness <laughs> that is thought about and visit by these people who are designating us. And you are exploring the chasm between that and the reality for 
Nigerians. Yeah, that's where that's why the title is so glorious because the reality could not be further from, from, from the, the declaration. Yes. Well, it's it's over forty years since your last uh, work of fiction, public uh, published work of fiction. Why now? What was the spark? First of all, this novel had been uh, sort of uh, welling up within for quite a number of years, probably a couple of decades, in fact, since we began going down the drain. Since, as far as I'm concerned, the humanity, we lost our humanity. Uh, everybody has his or her own watershed, the breaking point when the slide down began. Uh, now, I've treated the theme in other fashions, in short plays, in poetry, in polemics, you know, essays and so on. But of course, the more material uh, from actualities kept su surfacing and literally overwhelming, the more I needed um, a more discursive, more expansive kind of um, uh, medium. And I, and the prose, the novel, fiction, was, was obvious, it was the obvious answer. But then I also needed time, I needed detachment, even physical detachment, which didn't come easily, because if I thought I had, let's say, a week in hand, something interrupted. Reality overtook fiction, and I couldn't even start. So I had to wait until Fortunately, somebody lent me his little village in a village a cottage in Yene, in Senegal. And I was able to devote an uninterrupted eight days, maybe, away completely from Nigeria when I refused to even take note <laughs> of the existence of Nigeria. So I was able to do that. And not too long after that, I got another offer of a, a hideout in Ghana, not far from uh, um, Accra, and I jumped at it, and so I had again between eight and ten working days. So I was able to actually launch into, into it, to get my teeth slightly into it. Finally, you're sitting where it all came together, and that was Mr. Kovic, during the lockdown, when I locked myself down here, no interruption, no, just bed, desk, food, bed, you know, just like that, that with him continuously. So you could say that the format dictated itself ages ago, but finally got a chance to fulfill itself, you know during the COVID period. During the COVID. I mean, it's astonishing that you've been able to produce a work of this magnitude. Uh, the Nigerian edition is just over 500 pages uh, during this uh, lockdown. And you've just given some kind of, some hint now into how that played out. But uh, if you can just talk a bit more about how the, the, the lockdown, the pandemic, how, how you've you know, um, walked through that as a writer and uh, any other impacts on, on, your, on your writing life and processes? Well, first of all, the pandemic also, I shut it out, even though I was here, its victim, shut it out completely. Uh, I didn't go out during that uh, period. I, I just stayed in this environment. Oh, correction. Once or twice, I sneaked out. Um, to another lockdown place. In other words, I just got in my vehicle here and my late friend, J.P. Clark. We used to have a, a ritual, sort of a lunch, informal lunch club. There were three of us, one left, and uh, leaving just J.P. and myself. And after I'd done some heavy work on this for a while, I just needed a break, and at the same time, I did not want my isolation interrupted. So I just got out here, drove straight to his club over there, which was closed down, uh, and we sat in the, in the balcony there overlooking the, the creek, 
uh, along Awolowo Road. I had a usual lunch. I got back in the car and came right back here and continued work. I did that twice during the lockdown. Uh, so I, I shut the pandemic out of my mind completely. Uh, I, I realized it would be too depressing for me to, uh, to allow myself really to. I just said, well, what can one do beyond waiting to take one's injection, uh, vaccination, whenever we got the vaccines? And just do some, try and do some creative thinking during that period. You've just uh, mentioned J.P. Clark now, the poet, and you're well, part of the, with yourself, the pioneer class of Nigerian writing, Nigerian writers, really. Uh, and he's since left us. Are you glad now that you had that kind of interaction that you had with him very, in those last days? I was, I was very content, especially as uh, he knew I was, well, I to admit to him, that was what I was working on. And then I would come and say, Wale, Wale, where's this novel? Where's this novel? Ah, I said, look, 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 show me Jaja now. <laughs> Why did I even bother to tell you? I, I want to see it. I want to see it the moment it happens. You know, JP. I want to see it. And he actually, a couple of times when I uh, not, not was about to give up, but when I just said, what on earth am I doing with the, tra tackling this thing at this time? Especially during those periods when technology got the worst of me. Uh, you know, the young generation, they speak a totally different language from what we do. They speak internet, they speak laptop, they speak WhatsApp. So they won't get into the kind of trouble which I got into writing this novel. Yeah. When, uh, first of all, my laptop uh, crashed twice, twice. Uh, then when, even when it didn't crash, you had the situation with a, a this cast of thousands, quote unquote, in which they played tricks on me, uh, in which, uh, with the aid of the laptop, uh, you know, you're writing, you're revising all the time. And if you're not careful, and you don't speak the language of this technology, this beautiful technology, you'll, you'll start in the wrong place. And so the story will go elsewhere. And you say, wait a minute, I've this isn't what this character was doing at this time. You have to retract, retrace your steps. Retracing your steps, then your characters have already gone out on a limb on their own. So you come and tell During the crash of the, of the laptop. And then the crash, uh, the crash skin. Oh, it is, it is. So the characters themselves were quite unruly. They were, they were very unruly. Between those characters and the laptop, they nearly drove me insane. The combination, still. <laughs> uh, the the characters themselves, um, which did you find most challenging to write, perhaps? Especially of the Gong of Four, the quartet <laughs> at the heart of this novel. I don't know. I think they all, even the one who appeared uh, for the shortest time, even he was quite problematic on the Prince, 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 Prince Baditono, yes. Yeah, even, even he was quite a problem. I don't know whether it's such a good thing, really, to be locked up entirely with your characters, completely. I'm not sure now whether it would not have helped if I'd interacted, you know, just a little bit, a slice of reality from time to time, just to keep me uh, balanced. So with those characters, I don't know which of them gave me the biggest headache, because I was with them exclusively throughout the writing. Effectually, no, effectively throughout the writing. The good, so, the bad, and the ugly. The bad, the good, the ugly, quite right. I, I can't really see which one gave me the, the most trouble. It's very difficult to say. Um, you're indelible as a, as a playwright with the great plays, The Lion and the Jewel, uh, Death and the King's Horseman, Kungi's Harvest, and so many others. The poetry, uh, the nonfiction, uh, your prison memoir, The, uh, the Man Died. Um, has it been all too easy for some people to overlook the fact that you're also a fiction writer, do you think? Well, I don't really consider myself a fiction writer. You know, my, the novels I've written have happened by accident. Uh, I remember the first novel, my first venture into the fiction world, 
Well, I used to write short stories. I grew up actually writing short stories. But I never thought that I would, you know, write a novel. The first one, The Interpreters, the interpreters. Happened, yeah, happened during the period when my acting company, because I, I enjoy working with the acting company, not just writing plays, I actually enjoy being in the theater. And it was during a spell when my, the company just, it was very difficult to keep the company together, to do our usual weekend rehearsals, the improvisation exercises, and so on and so forth, which is very frustrating. And the interpreters came during that hiatus, so I didn't intend it. After that, I can't remember how Season of Anime happened, why it happened, except that maybe I'd encountered a number of, uh, I was looking at my generation and wondering how we were impacting on society, which was changing. Uh, the interpreters was sort of the beginning of looking at the characters, generation to which I belong. And with the season of anime, went back a little bit into mythology, etc., etc. I can't remember how that happened. Uh, in this particular case, of course, I've explained that it, it took too long to happen, that it had meant to happen long before. Uh, but I still don't consider myself uh, a novelist. I, I'm more at home in the theater. You're holding a mirror to the unvarnished truth of Nigerian society in this book. I mean, you've done in, in so many other ways before in your, in your earlier works. But um, th there's a scene where we're advised, a, a character is advised that only uh, people of strong constitution may look at a particular vista. And there are so many passages like that where, um, where you're worried that um, it may be a bit heavy going for some readers. Well, people always said I'm a heavy going writer anyway, so what's new? <laughs> I, 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 I mean, the, the, the showing us the uh, portrayal, the depiction of the savagery, the butchery, the bestiality of what is everyday reality in Nigeria now. Was there a concern, um, number one, that some readers might find that uh, a bit hard to stomach? And also, did that, having to dredge all of that up, did it do anything? Was it emo emotionally tasking for you yourself? I know, I know what you mean, and in fact, the, I, can, I can confess to you there was a bit of self-censorship in it. Uh, there was one theme which, uh, which uh, actually put a lot of pressure on me. That's the kidnapping of youth. Okay, there's a little bit of that, but not to the extent uh, to which I would have wanted to treat it. But it, I just decided. I had to keep away from that, otherwise it'll have been a completely humorless work. You know, it would have been exceedingly dark. There's one thing which I haven't been able to cope with uh, among all the various evils that have befallen this society and the, the degradation of humanity, the de derangement, and that is the kidnapping of youth, the kidnapping of our children. It's just something for me, there's no way I would have treated it uh, and yet managed to infuse what I'm so happy about, as one of the happy people. Uh, people have remarked that, yes, actually it's very funny in part, so I'm told. I'm very relieved about that. And so I'm glad that I did that self-censorship. So if people find, even after that self-censorship, which was also creative, not political self-censorship. No, it was purely psychological for me personally, and creative in terms of what I felt I was capable of portraying without actually going into the, into the abyss of de depression. If after that people still find what is there heavy, rather heavy going, well, it shows how down, down society has plunged how we've departed from what I call human. Because I ask myself, the question I ask myself very much these days is, haven't we, isn't it about time we redefined human? What actually is human? Uh, and there are some 
actions which place us outside the pale of human, which have become routine in and this in this day, society. Every day, headlines. every day, every day. So if it's heavy going for people, well, I think we better sit, pause, take a look, and see whether uh, facts are not even stranger than fiction. Let's talk a bit about one of your literary forerunners, D.O. Fagunwa, yes. who wrote primarily in the Yoruba language and whose first novel you translated as uh, Igbo Irumole, which you translated as Forest of a Thousand Demons. Yes, yes demons. <laughs> now, the, the first chapter of Chronicles from the Land of the Happiest People on Earth is in Yoruba, at least the, the edition that I've read, Okay, Koroimoro, the Hill of Knowledge and Enlightenment. And uh, I, I, was, I, I was thinking about uh, Fagunwa reading uh, this new novel from you. Um, there are several hills. In Fagunwa, people are always going up hills. And there's just that texture that, and I wondered if you'd um, talk a bit. And th there's always also a sense of the outlandish in the everyday. And I thought you might want to talk about any elusive relationship that you might have been exploring with the works of um, Shafagwa. Well, I'm very glad you made this, uh, you asked this question. I think my love of language, language as such, no matter what, and I speak uh, some French, I speak some uh, Spanish, uh, and uh, I study language in, in uh, with literature. Uh, and that fascination with language actually came from, the beginning of it was my encounter with Fagoa as a child. This is where my love of language actually came. And it pushed me straight away to recognizing, shall we say, parallels, you know, in the, lang in the literature of other people, specifically, and most, of course, importantly for me, since we're British colonial, the English language. And very often when people say, oh, my language is complex and so on and so forth, I would say, oh, what a pity they haven't read Fagnoir. They will understand how language really can be. Uh, complex and yet very stimulating and challenging, and how language itself can be related to fictionalizing. Because if you if you are fascinated by language, that very fascination, the play on words, uh, which even leads sometimes to concocting uh, words, how this can even lead to complexities in characters. In other words, that. When you picture, you hear a character say something and say it in more than one language, more than one idiom, it even affects the actions of uh, such uh, a character. And so that's where Fagnoa uh, comes in. And I set out, in fact, I set out back to translate all of Fagnoa. That was my ambition after I finished my studies in England. I was going to. After the first novel, I said, wait a minute, Mr. Walishuinka, if you intend to write anything of your own, you better just give Fagwa <laughs> a break, because you will never write anything of your own. But uh, fortunately, I was able to still come back after some years and tackle yet another uh, Fagwa. And each time I read Fagwa, it enriches me a lot, a lot. Were you thinking about about that? Uh, no, I wasn't thinking about Fagnoir. When I when I when I write, I'm, I'm not thinking about any other, not consciously anyway. Inevitably, of course, echoes from what you've read, um, you know, come and play a role. Uh, for instance, people, uh, uh, commentators have also said that um, there's an atmosphere of who done it, like a detective. Uh, aspect in uh, the work, but this again is where what you've read, what you've loved, plays a role. Subconsciously sometimes, consciously sometimes, echoes of what you've eaten, you know, comes into what you uh, disgorge. And there's a sprinkling of um, Yoruba phrases. I mean, I've just mentioned oh, the title of the I can never help uh, that. Yes, the sprink sprinkling of Yoruba that. throughout. Yes, and, yes. And uh, part of the excitement, I think, of writing in a different language is 
the fact that you fought something in Yoruba, how do you express it sometimes? And when you can't express it, you just put the Yoruba there and trans do a rough translation as a footnote. Yeah, which, which makes it all the more interesting. And um, I, I think something that you hinted at in the interpreters decades ago, it, it really um, comes to the fore here, um, this suggestion that religious leaders and political leaders may be joined in some kind of holy, unholy alliance against the people. Yeah. I wondered if you might want to speak well, to that. Until kidnapping came along, religion was the fastest growing business in Nigeria. And it isn't just Nigeria. Uh, but let's begin by admitting that every profession has its charlatans, right? Uh, and I don't want to imply that all priesthood of all religions, you know, uh, the, the priesthood is necessarily corrupt. But there's no question at all that religion, the religion, uh, the profession, which, because that's what it is, called religion, seems to attract a disproportionate and really vicious level of charlatans. I mean, really. Uh, not just criminal, but dehumanized. That uh, it's pick up the paper. Not just in this country alone. Look at the note, the the scandal which which rocked, and from time to, from time to time still surfaces with Roman uh, the Roman Catholic Church, with uh, priests who have been abusing uh, children sexually all their lives, who traumatized people all their lives. Look at the uh, unholy alliance between uh, priesthood in this country and of various religions who actually fortify, quote unquote, spiritually. People about to go out yeah. and kidnap yeah. and kill and rob Murder and rape. And rob, yeah. Who pray for them, their protection, and then they even come back encourage and them to commit more crimes by saying, bring me this part of this person, of uh, a body, so I can create more fortifications for you. And then the excusing. Look at this very country, in which somebody, having been careless enough to build uh, a flawed uh, structure for worship, the house collapsed on top of hundreds of, uh, of worshippers, not just from this country, from South Africa, from everywhere. And what does he say? He says uh, if, if, if a plane must have been flying around and uh, its vibrations uh, shook, the, shattered uh, the building and got away with it. And uh, go further back, yet sister religion to that one. I remember some years ago, pilgrims on their way to Mecca, they crashed in a plane. It turned out that that plane was not supposed to be flying, but they flew it anyway. Presumably, it felt that Allah would protect the king because of the, of the corruption, the greed of the uh, tour, the plane uh, charter flight and so on. So religion really has become a, a criminal sector for uh, many in, in this nation. At the same time, again, let me stress this. Religion has played a very positive role in the life of many. In a lot of community service, we know very sincere, self-sacrificing um, uh, religious leaders. And so all we're saying to them is, look, clean up your act. The gong of four, the quartet of friends, of friends who were in school together, they chose as their insignia uh, a Benin bronze, were actually surrounded by uh, artifacts and uh, you know, African art here, uh, as a Benin bronze. And Benin bronzes are very much in the news these days, a lot of debate about the repatriation of looted uh, African art, especially the Benin bronzes. Um, what are your thoughts on, on that situation? Well, I have proposed and still, you know, I think is a valid proposition that uh, the world, especially the so-called developed world, owes Africa a lot. There's a lot of reparation to be made. 
uh, goes all the way back to the very beginnings of slavery, before we even get to the imperialist adventure, misadventure, the colonization, uh, the continuing aspects of neo-colonialism, if you like, uh, the unequal treatment till today, even in world caucuses of African society and the black race in general. The Trans-Sahara tra uh, slave trade, transatlantic, the lot. And I have proposed that we cannot live continuously in the past, in blame, passing, apportionment. And the artworks of any society represent for me the spiritual, the authentic spiritual precipitates of any society, any community, any culture. And these were taken away, very often at the point of a gun, as loot, you know, to fetch astronomical prices all over the world, to be hoarded by galleries. Uh, people go to those galleries, they pay to enter, to come and, and, and there's no royalty paid to the, the originators of these works. And so I proposed that let all stolen, looted, artworks, bronze, uh, uh, fabric, uh, cement, whatever, iron work, let all artworks be sent back to where they were stolen from. And I'm willing to be the first to sign on the chapter, on the articles of forgiveness and complete reconciliation with the world in entirety. So give them back, no questions asked. Give them back, no questions asked, and I won't even mention history anymore. But as long as that is not done, we're going to continue to say to these people, you stole. The world is changing. The world has changed. New questions are being asked. New generations are even taking their own forebears to task and saying, was this a good thing which you did? in the name of quote-unquote the future we are supposed to be that future we don't want any part of it give those things back so yeah, I, I see no moral reason why the world cannot come to terms with a repatriation of all looted material from the african continent yes and those who say for instance that nigeria would not be able to take care of these artworks those they people who no, say that they, they have get no their argument. mouths slapped what, who are they to talk about, you know, Nigerians cannot, I, I, I just, I've told them, I, I, they, sh they shouldn't even say things, they shouldn't even think things like that. It's, a con it's adding insult to injury. Some of our artworks, in fact, some of our artworks, take the Mbari, um, Mbari works of the Igbo, for instance, they're even made with a consciousness of decay. When those statues are made, they are left to decay, to go back to nature. So. The art, there's so many different levels of artifacts, the creation of the creative, the, the material creativity of uh, humanity. And they should let those things be in situ, to speak to and be spoken to by those for whom it has a meaning. So if the meaning is destruction, let it self-destruct. <laughs> and if it is lack of care, let yes, it be. Yes, let let it, it, it be. be. Just give them back. It's ours. We can do what we like with it. Thank you. Very thank much. you. Thank you. Uh, staying with, um, uh, going back to the novel, the Piton paints. Their fortune was built on complicity with this, the slave trade, and they don't task themselves too much about it. And it, it, it's also like the country of Nigeria. Yeah. We, don't, um, we don't reckon or talk enough yeah. about the legacy of the, the, the slave trade or the preservation of even the monuments that will help us to remember. I thought mm -hmm. you were addressing this in some way yes. in the novel. Yes, I like to bring it up from time to time because yeah. that is also part of our reality. The selling of human beings and the yes, reckoning the, the with, the selling with of human the beings. part of some of our people mm -hmm. in, in this um, mm -hmm. inhuman yes. trade. Yeah. Two, two levels of that, in fact. First of all, there is a failure to come to terms with our past. It's very real and it's a failing. 
I've had arguments uh, with some of my colleagues, some of them late now, really acerbic uh, uh, arguments that, uh, I, that I, don't want to, I don't want us to gloss over our own past, our own errors. Otherwise, we continue, you know, which this is common sense, we'll continue to make the same mistakes all over again. When I was doing uh, research uh, into the uh, uh, slave trade, you know, my younger days actually not so long ago, uh, especially the Trans-Saharan slave trade, I went to visit it, revisited Badagri. And I looked into the histories of two families. There was a family, <clears throat> the contrast is very interesting. Both of them have museums actually in, in Lagos Badagri. One family had come to terms with their own pernicious role in the slave trade. The other one, by contrast, seemed to continue to glory in it. They find absolutely nothing wrong in uh, no, no, not the slightest embarrassment about their wealth, the, the wealth of their family having been built on the slavery. Not even the, the grimace, no. It was, one of them said, <clears throat> well, it was either you were enslaved or you were enslaved, but that is wrong. I know of a, a family, for instance, in uh, Akwa Ibom. Uh, in fact, I went for the launching of the, of the book written on the, by the, one, of the, um, um, one of the offspring of that family, uh, which detailed the refusal of this chief to sell his own people, absolutely refused. Others were making tons and tons of money. He said, I will never sell my people. And so all societies, you know, let's admit this, all societies have their, their quote-unquote devils and they have their angels, including the gray uh, areas. And even our lack of respect for our own artworks is what has given, as we say, mouth to other people to say, if we give it back to you, we, you'll only let it rot. You know, they have no right to say that. But it's also because even those artworks, which we know are aesthetic pieces of which we have a right to be proud, and which are still retained and still being reproduced by the family, the lines of the original makers, we don't look after them properly. There's no question. The consciousness now is changing, but the fact is that in many, many instances, uh, we have not yet fully come to terms with the, the import, not just the importance, but the import of these works in our lives. There's one other <clears throat> aspect which is very much, which relates to what I was saying earlier. It is our failure to acknowledge our own criminality against our own kind, which has uh, worked uh, in favor of kidnappers in this country. Uh, we have failed to make kidnappers understand that they are reintroducing slavery into our lives, with the difference that we're even making things easier for them. We send our children to school, to boarding school, or even they don't have to, they don't have to boarding school, they even go in daytime. And they, instead of hunting people down now, we, we just give it to them. You know, they know where to find slaves, because it's another kind of slavery. It's the same reinstated slavery. And now they capture slaves, and then they say to their relations, come and buy them back. This is the gospel, quote unquote, which we've been trying to impress on people, especially the outside world. To say slavery is being reintroduced in Nigeria actively. And therefore, uh, it's not just the business of Nigeria alone. It's primarily our business, of course, primarily our responsibility. But if the world says that uh, there are treaties now and decrees everywhere against slavery, then what's going on in this country should not continue for one day longer. I'm talking about 
actually a global war, physical if necessary, against those who are reintroducing slavery into this encampment. And it's our failure to, to come to really grapple with the intensity of reducing human beings to subhumans. If we actually felt it, if we felt our history that way, we'd feel for these children who are really being taken into slavery, being treated as slaves, including sex slaves, you know. And then we're being told, come and take back your damaged goods at a price, just like the old slave trade. What is the difference? I see now. And, and people are being reduced also to body parts. Yes. And, and, and we're going around pay. as if life is normal, as if nothing horrendous is taking place right under our noses. It's only this, uh, when the state, the, the last kidnapping, uh, but no, uh, no, was, that, was, was that Zamfara? Zamfara? I can't remember. So I, many I, I, I have to so many, they know rolled. which is the most recent. They roll one after but another. This governor, he clamped down, um, he inter uh, uh, immediately decreed um, um, a curfew. And for me, <clears throat> this is along the lines of what I proposed uh, some time ago that anytime our children are taken, that state should close down until those children are brought back. Yes, we'll all undergo privation. COVID closed us down, didn't it? What did we do to COVID? You know, we knuckled down under it. And for me, we've reached that stage where we say, all right, everything shuts down until we get those children back. Until we do that, this is going to become a phenomenon which people, well, it's already happening anyway. They go in the houses. Nowhere is safe. Churches, mosques, schools, homes, what's left? Now, uh, generational trauma is uh, something that people recognize now, that especially formerly enslaved uh, populations suffer from. And the kind of horrors we're seeing, daily horrors that we're seeing in Nigeria now, could generational trauma be in some way uh, an explanation for some of it, at least, especially when we talk about slave trade and, and, and so on. No, the trauma is being inserted now. The trauma is not responsible for the self-inflicted atrocities that are going on. But a new trauma is being imposed, is being inserted into the psyche of, uh, of a new generation. And I'm not talking theoretically. Here, there, there's one uh, event, uh, my birthday, which I uh, submit to quite gracefully, which I, in fact, look forward to. And that is when the school children come to visit me. That's one event which I actually love. And usually, it's, uh, they've taken um, this essay competition all over the country. And the winners, one of their prizes, that they come and spend uh, an hour or two with me. And the last two events, it didn't take place, it hadn't taken place this year uh, because of um, still COVID. It was the last year it didn't take place. Anyway, the most recent two, the questions which I was asked by some of these children was a question based on fear. And they asked, what's happening to us? We, are we, what's going to happen to us? We, we live with this fear of being kidnapped. So it's not just those who are kidnapped, who are being now traumatized. It's their siblings, their friends. They see what's happening, they see the anguish, the agony, and they become afraid. And we're now building a generation, a traumatized generation. And how that trauma will manifest itself in society is one of the reasons why we should start worrying and proceed to take drastic action at whatever cost. How, now, taking stock of all of that, this kind of atmosphere, how, how does it make you feel? It's 16 or so years after the Climate of Fear lectures, for instance, your wreath lectures from 2004, yes. exactly climate about of fear. climate. Of course, the, 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 the fear has transmogrified, the, the I guess. But how do you feel going about. down generation. Yeah. It's no longer the adult world which is uh, living in fear. 
it's the generation, and, and, and it's just, it didn't even begin with kidnapping. It began also with religious extremism. Yes. This so-called Boko Haram uh, uh, revanches. I'm right, you are dead, you called it then. Yeah. I'm right, you are dead. Yes, yes, yeah. I'm right, you're dead. <laughs> yeah. Because I'm right, that's why you're dead. Wailing school children on their way to school, beating up and killing their parents for sending them to school. So this trauma, uh, this very unique nature of uh, uh, trauma, which is mostly directed at the most vulnerable part of society. I mean, you and I, we can weather a little bit of level of trauma. We hope we don't have to. But these are the people who cannot, who are not really inured, who haven't built up any kind of resistance to this assault, this gross, cowardly assault by these so-called Islamic fundamentalists, Boko Haram, Iswap, uh, Al-Shabaab, and Swadin, who are so inadequate in themselves that they can only fulfill their own uh, self-realization by torturing other people, by reducing other people, by reducing womanhood to ciphers in society, brutalizing the female uh, gender simply because they, they need to feel superior beings. I mean, they are criminal, they are blasphemers, and for me, they should be wiped off the face of the earth. And until society come to, comes to terms with the fact that the traumatizing of any sector of society is traumatizing, if not immediately, is building up trauma for the totality of society, I'm sorry, we're going to find ourselves just walking zombies. The next generation. Now with, uh, let's talk about Black Lives Matter and relate that with the kind of horrors that are, that are being visited uh, by black people upon black people in the largest black nation in the world. Uh, you, you touch on this in The Man Died, where you talk about, you know, this is suffering that has been for hundreds of years, but here it's different. It's black on black. You, you did write a passage like that in The Man Died. And you, you, you return to that rumination in Chronicles from the Land of the Happiest People on Earth, where you, you say this is savagery beyond race. It's beyond color. It's outside, it's outside color or history. Yes, savagery beyond race, outside color or history. Uh, what, just, just the irony when we're talking about state uh, violence against black people in the US and we talk about black lives mattering, do black lives matter in Nigeria? A very good question. I'm very glad that we're, we're, we're on this subject. How society was able to absorb, to accept, for instance, the massacre that took place, the El Zaki, Zak Zaki group, I'm not holding Zaya. any um, uh, any fault for their beliefs or what some of the extremists do. But how is it possible? I mean, we know about the details uh, that the the army, uh, um, the general, his convoy was uh, being harassed, or not, being, not being people. given okay. right of way, but they were unarmed. How is it possible to mow down over to, I forgot the figure now, over 200, the, the death toll in that was close, was around 200. Yes. How is it possible in modern society, in peacetime, to actually kill in one fell swoop 200 people? Beyond a few individuals like uh, Femi Falano and the others, we all seem to have forgotten that this was a crime against humanity. No matter the cause, how could, how, how, how could just around 200 people, unarmed people, be mown down just like that? And all over the world, Uli, for instance, and yet another uh, quote-unquote civilian this, well, militrician, the, the, the death toll over there, the total wiping out of a village simply because two policemen had been killed, they shouldn't have been killed, nobody is saying that because the next thing they will say, well, it's all right to kill policemen. On the contrary, I, I find myself furious when even policemen are killed, and I've written about it. 
that NSAS, let's move to NSAS for instance, because it's not just the state uh, which needs to be told that black lives matter. It's even we ourselves, our own people. How can you chase a human being because he's in uniform, he's unarmed at that time, but because you've been hurt somewhere, or you believe me hurt somewhere, then you pick on a policeman, strip him bare, put a tie around his neck, roast him, to use that ugly Nigerian expression, which in this case is justified because after that they then shared the meat, so to speak. I mean, when did we descend? How did we descend to that level? Policemen are also human beings. They have families. They have loves they and have, fears. They have lovers. They have dependents. And people are able to shrug that up. Side by side with dealing systematically with the SARS, disbanding them, punishing them, placing them on trial, we must learn also to put on trial those who kill for killing's sake, who use any excuse whatsoever to, uh, to uh, indulge the savage beast in them, the predator in them. They are not fighting for a cause in which you and I believe. I, be I refuse to accept the fact that they were acting in the same spirit as those who organized NSARS. Well, no, no. We must separate them and we must deal with them as monsters in our midst, monsters on the same level as the SARS killers, torturers, uh, against whom we are protesting. We must be big, large, and brave and courageous and honorable enough to identify the monsters in our midst and make sure that they do not inculcate society with their level of barbarity. What can we still do with language in this kind of um, really re this uh, heightened, uh, ab absurd uh, environment that we're living in now? What is the what is the use of language and what is the role of the writer? Uh, now you 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 go back indirectly to your original question with, with which we began this conversation: Why the novel now? Yeah. Yes, the the the, the language which. Um, the event, the phenomenon dictates the language. I think, um, again, you spoke about the sort of heaviness, the, the darkness of this whole thing. I, when I glance through that uh, uh, novel from time to time, because I have to, when they ask me to read a portion of it, I still get the feeling that I didn't even make the novel dark enough. I think the language the language tilted over to the satiric side a bit too much. I think, I, I feel, I feel, I feel, let me put it that way. Because I really, I want, I, I feel I really want to place this society on the pillory, you know, in the stocks, you know, that, in the stocks for a few years, you know, the stock, this medieval uh, equipment for punishing people, usually dissidents, unfortunately. Uh, which you stick man's head through the hole and the arms, and society comes and pelts, you know. That is the right language, but with hard stuff, not just tomatoes and rotten tomatoes and eggs, you know, but really hard stuff. This society needs to be woken up. I'm talking about the people, we ourselves. We need to, to wake up from our complacency and, and try and recover our humanity whichever way we want to do it. And of course, we writers also have a role to play in that and selecting real brutal language for brutal uh, situations. I think we, we cannot cozy up to this society any longer. And we, we're moving away from a position where we can say we, they, because all of us are getting involved. We're getting compromised, not that we approve of our failure, our failure to address this systematically, to act in a way which says, so far and no further. We should never even have got this far. And we're not doing that. And this depresses me. So putting or holding this country 
or putting this country on the in the stocks or on the stocks you said uh, you're one of the greatest writers in the world your readers are all over the world how do you think your international readers will what kind of entry point do you think they will find in this novel uh, chronicles uh, from the land of the happiest people on earth how might they what would they take from this novel well uh, the first thing to say uh, is to emphasize the fact that this is a novel primarily for this society so that's it first of all it's for Nigerians. But then, of course, it's, it, it, I, I don't pretend that uh, I, 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 the, the work would not attract leadership outside. Of course it must. Uh, people anywhere must also recognize themselves in aspects of this novel. And I hope that is something which they will take away from it. But also uh, not fail to enjoy some of the the creative uh, tricks of the trade <laughs> in there, which I enjoyed inserting when I was writing it. Uh, that's all I, I can say. But basically, uh, it's, it's, this is a work which I very much hope that Nigerians do read, and it looks as if they are. Yeah, it looks like it's, it looks as if they're reading it. Yes, um, creative tricks of the trade, you say. Um, <laughs> With the characters, there are a lot of characters that uh, seem like thinly veiled <laughs> uh, depictions of some, some, some of our real life uh, characters in our, in, our, in our national life. Um, how did you go about creating some of those characters? Um, well, and you know, lampooning some of these. I mean, well, there's there's no a, there's a, there is a Shekere Garuba. Mm, yes, and, and so um, yeah. other yes. people like some, that. Some of these characters, they really offended decency, they offended humanity, not just Nigerian humanity, humanity in general, and they deserve what they get. <laughs> the, the symbolism of that character who sort of uh, represents the best uh, of us. Uh, yeah, if you can go see Yes, there's no question at all that uh, it's, it's an amalgam, by the way. Okay. Just that even the president, uh, the prime minister, is an amalgam of various... If you look closely, oh, you yes, see bits yes, and pieces. Yes, yes. <laughs> uh, Dior Le Pen is a continuing um, friendship affair uh, with one of the greatest friends. Uh, perhaps, you know, easily the best friend that I've ever known, who's late now, and who represented, on the one hand, uh, joie de vivre, just the love of life. In fact, I would say I owe my, um, my ability to enjoy what I do enjoy of life to him, because he enjoyed life so much, and yet he was so creative, so serious a person, very innovative also, uh, and, uh, and so that was a part tribute to him also. Uh, and of course I took the episode of the, the assassination of a, a, another friend uh, who was a minister, I took that part yes. also from that event, because I want Nigerians to remember how people are just wasted just wasted in this community and um, and that's it we just go on to waste a few more but also to remind us that yes there is a very productive creative part of us that we have people all over the world and that we are acknowledged as whether it's the medical sciences we have people in nasa you know uh, who worked on components of rockets which have gone into space then we have those as well very inventive people we have agricultural geniuses who are constantly experimenting with farms and saving you and me from who can't plant anything from hunger so i need i need it also for my own uh, equilibrium to ensure that there is at least one definitely more character even in this bleak circumstances. This bleak landscape. The ones who really 
who, who, have, who enjoy the, who understand what the meaning of happiness is and strive towards it, both for themselves and, and for, for others. others. Yes. There's a fire incident in this novel, and it just, the poetry of that, of that. Can you share something about how, how you, how that feat of it, the imagination, how you conjured that? Well, if you remember this, um, I think the record which I, the one record which I can boast I love of my having country, okay. I know go like. The, that record was the product of dramatic sketches. You know, the song in there, in fact, was, I love my country, was one I of I love my country, I know go like. Yeah. And the sketches were written, my guerrilla theater, at a time when fire became the symbol of this nation. Finance offices were going up on fire. Anything which had to do with accounting was going on fire. Whether it was Abuja, it was Lagos, that has not yet stopped. But that period was the period of fire and brimstone. No sooner was an inquiry, uh, commission inquiry set up somewhere, a fire went up. So I am uh, an inheritor of that particular phase. And the phenomenon of fire, not as a, as a cleansing, but as a cover-up uh, agency, has always been with me. And uh, it's, it's something which I don't want this country ever to lose sight of, always, and to watch out for, because that phenomenon is still very much with us. Yes. Professor Wolishwenka, thank you so much for this conversation. You're welcome. And uh, you. all the best of luck with the novel. Thank you for watching. Please find details on your screen about how to buy copies of the books discussed today. Thank you for joining us and we're very grateful to Professor Wale Inka for the rich insights into his work and writing life. Welcome. Like flowers cultivate in cracks in the concrete, culture grows in the spaces between the everyday. It's there in darkened rooms when the stage lights come on. It's in a park full of people, belting out the same song. It happens in classrooms, having a go, hands-on. It's found in small circles, exchanging stories. It's under a tent, making brand new discoveries. It's in those shared experiences that help build communities. It inspires change, provides opportunities. It brings joy, sparks curiosity. It provokes feelings recognisable to everyone making our hearts race and giving us goosebumps. It's for those who don't think they can have it. It's for those who know that they need it. It fosters connection and understanding. It is ours for the taking, as well as the sharing. Culture is what makes us human. It makes our world better. Culture is our culture. Let's explore it together. summer we went to a theme park except we didn't actually make it we got half the way there and then my baby sister did a big sick on my dad's trousers so we had to turn back he looked up he hadn't written the next bit down but felt he should add I mean it was really a lot of baby sick and my dad didn't have a spare pair of trousers and he couldn't go on the roller coaster in his pants I think the way he talked is, was really engaging, it was very interesting. It was quite interactive because he got up and walked around the crowd and asked the children stuff as well, which was really nice um, for the kids to get involved. So I picked the squirrel up 
kids looked at me and the squirrel sort of seemingly just came to life. It jumped at my hand, it jumped on one kid's head, jumped on another kid's head, jumped on a picture frame, fell off the picture frame and landed on the flip lid of one of those flip bins and slid into the bin. It's like, oh my God, I was a squirrel in the bin. Okay, but it's all right. Kids were like, oh, wow, you fixed it. Absolutely. <laughs> I was an only child raised by a single working mom and you know I thought life was very boring and that's why I started writing fiction so I didn't have anything interesting to write on paper but it, what intrigued me was the possibility of going beyond the self that was given to me by birth. Never in the, in the entire history of the world has there been a species until ours which could take action to save the species or the world. Everything that I do now is about um, showing off. Because if you haven't realised, I'm a colossal show-off who definitely loves the sound of his own voice. So kind of the podcasting, performing, book writing, all of it's kind of storytelling and kind of sharing what goes on behind the scenes, really. The fun thing for me about diving is the adrenaline rush of it. So standing on the diving board, knowing that you could do like the most perfect and magnificent dive and come up to like, wow, you're doing really good. Or you could cut like something could go horrifically wrong and you land flat and then you're, you know, lifted out of the pool. I'm ashamed to say, because people had such a bad time. I'm ashamed to say I had an absolutely lovely lockdown because I was just writing. Then I'd take a walk and I lived by the river, so that was lovely. And then I'd write some more and then I'd cook. I was heavenly. You were sitting between Frank Sinatra, Gregory Peck. You've also met James Dean. Jimmy said, would you like me to give you a lift in my car? It's a new Porsche. And he got to Beverly Hills in about three and a half minutes flat. I have never been so frightened in my life. Who's your favorite A-lister? Paul Newman, charming, lovely. He became a really good friend. The most regret that I wish I'd had done was Cruella de Vil, oh. you know, in 101 Dalmatians. I really wanted to do that because um, I thought, I am Cruella de Vil. Yeah. <laughs> and you became a dame in 2015. Prince Charles presided over the investment. What did he say? Can you reveal? He said, about time too. Mm -hmm.